Now, we have consumer protection directives. For example, the consumer protection directive in, in Europe says that the consumer, if the consumer buys a good, buys this, okay, he has seven days to think it over. And if he changes his mind, after seven days, he can go back to the store and say, I don't want this anymore. Take it back. And I don't have to pay anything, except for the money that is needed to give this object back. OK? That's European directive. But European directive doesn't impose to Italy, for example, to make this period longer. So if Italy wants to say, OK, I like consumers more, let's give them 10 days instead of seven. They can do that. So a company that sells from the Netherlands to Italy has to know what is the period, so-called withdrawal period, withdrawal period, of the consumer in Italy that, you know, so they have to wait, okay, and it's a ninth day, we're still happy, okay, we're running row race. And then the, the tenth day, the guy comes back and he says, oh, I don't like this anymore. Why you can't? Because it's seven days. No, in Italy it's ten. Oops, I have to get back the thing, and uh, you know, and maybe it's not working as I used to work, and you know, for some reason he didn't like it. Maybe he just wanted to work 10 days. So there was an issue before the Court of Justice, because one producer said, okay, I'll take this back. But then you have to pay me uh, the amount of money that you would have spent if you had rented this thing for 10 days. Uh, Big issue. The uh, Court of Justice finally said, no, you can't do that because it's written in European law that the consumer has no other charge but the money that it needed to give this thing back. No other burden, so you can't pay the rental uh, uh, cost for having the good for 10 days. But different states can regulate in different matters. And this is an obstacle. Because the company, especially small companies, they don't want to go crazy knowing all the rules. Okay, so even internet sales are affected. We thought of having internet and everyone would be happy because you don't have distribution costs. You know, before you had to have companies going around making advertisements, uh, letting consumers know the product, and that was very costly. Now you have internet. And with internet, it's, everything is easier. But for the fact that the rules are still there, and they may be tricky, and although you have internet, it could be very difficult to cope with all legislation uh, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, <clears throat> so what do we do about it? Commission in 2001 launched a consultation. Said, OK, there's something wrong here. We have to resolve this issue. Uh, 300 and some uh, institutions and consumer association companies answered saying the problem is this. Then there was a green paper in 2010. Then other pieces of legislation. Now we have a proposal of regulation which is called the <coughs> Common European Sales Law. Okay. If you read this common European sales law proposal, it's like having contract law all here, a uniform contract law for all Europe. It's like a uniform commercial code in the United States, more or less, somewhat different, but just to have an idea, okay? How does this thing, how do, would this thing work if it was adopted? It, it's about to be adopted, but still, we have some discussion there. It should be a, an optional, optional tool, meaning that European Union doesn't oblige with the regulation mandatory rules to adopt this. But if the parties choose to have their transaction regulated by the uniform uh, sales uh, law, European Union for sales law, then that transaction is regulated under all these rules, which cope with everything. 
consent, fraud, misrepresentation, the forming of the contract, offer, acceptance, you know all the rules, you know? But the difference is in the rules. For example, you know that in America, the contract is formed when uh, acceptance is mailed, not when the acceptance is received by the offering party. What rule do you have here? I'm not sure. When is the contract formed? When the acceptance of the offer reaches the offering party or when the acceptance is just sent, so-called mailbox rule, you know? In the United States called the mailbox rule because what is needed is that you just put that in the mailbox. Uh, in Italy, for example, it's when you reach the knowledge of the, of the offering party. And here, it's that type of approach that is followed, okay? So, the rules are very detailed and tell you exactly what happens in this circumstance, if, what kind of damage you can, you can claim in case of non-performance, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, it's like having a book on contract law with all the specific details set forth, and this should be an optional uh, uh, tool that the companies, small and medium companies, not large companies, because this only is addressed to small and medium enterprises. Because the big problem of exports has to do with small and medium enterprises. Uh, this optional tool uh, could be an answer to resolve this implementation, I would say, of the common of the common market. Okay. So bear in mind, if anybody of you who are interested in uh, in um, say I need money, here is the money, because then the local authorities have to monitor how you are spending this money. For example, they may be subject to conditions. Uh, in many cases, they may be sub, sub, they, the money is subject to occupation engagement, meaning that the company has to hire at least five people for at least two years. Otherwise, they don't get the grant. So you really have to control how they're spending this money and if these five people have been hired or not. Because if they have not been hired, the grant is <coughs> withdrawn, taken back. And if you know, and there is civil and criminal procedures. You can't just get the grant, or you cannot lie if you say you want to spend this money in a brick factory. Uh, you can't then produce milk. Uh, because if you do, or if you produce both, or if you're distorting, if you're using the money for different purposes, the European Commission is going to strike you, is going to strike the state, and the state is going to strike you. Uh, so there is a, a whole variety of rules that are adopted to make sure that the money that is granted uh, is, is actually finalized and used for the purposes for which it was accorded. Um, and it can be very burdensome. This is a problem. So you have to provide a lot of papers, certificates, saying that you actually set up a company, the company has its seat here, you bought a building, how much did it cost this? Let me see if actually that was the price. Let me see how much you spent for renovating it. I want to have all the invoices. And then there is inspectors. You send inspectors all the time. You go to uh, the guy who provided uh, uh, chairs or, or tables and said, do you really sold this number of chairs to this other guy? Is the invoice correct? because we found many false invoices. Uh, so it's a very complicated issue, but it, so a lot of money is, has been lost, to tell you the truth. But some of it finally reached its destination and promoted the development. That's, that's also the case. Okay? Thank you. Other, other questions? Okay. Yeah? yeah. Uh, for instance, I am a manufacturer in Italy, and I would like to sell my goods in Switzerland, for instance. Switzerland is not part of the European Union, oh, okay. but, but not, Turkey. Not, not, be, not, uh, let it be Spain. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to find out all the potential obstacles uh, according to the uh, consumer protection, civil law, and so forth. 
and uh, I say that if you want to buy my goods uh, according to the freedom of uh, the agreement uh, all our problems will be solved according to my law so the law of uh, Italy is it possible to avoid this obstacle in this way? Now, um, <laughs> consumer protection rules really aim at protection, protecting consumers if what you say was possible you would easily uh, go around uh, the norm. So consumer protection uh, rules are generally mandatory and the rules that apply are the rules of the habitual residence of the consumer. Okay? So the criterion is uh, whatever you pick, you can pick British law, Spanish law, whatever, what applies is the, the law of the habitual residence of the consumer. Okay? So that contract would be invalid as for the provision that uh, doesn't uh, uh, fulfill the threshold, the minimum protection threshold which is granted by the local, by the local uh, consumer protection rule. Uh, this regulation says if it is adopted, this regulation would provide an exception to the minimum because this regulation is common for all and would prevail uh, on the uh, mandatory local rule for consumers because it would be common for everybody. So this already provides high protection for consumers. But uh, until this is approved, you still have to cope with mandatory rules for consumers. So the company can go around that obstacle. In theory, if the consumer doesn't complain, they can, but if the consumer complain before a local jurisdiction, they will win the case because you have agreed uh, on different on a different ground with different uh, uh, <coughs> obligations, which uh, were in uh, in the violation of uh, consumer protection rules. So there are some mandatory, and also there is other regulation, Rome One, Rome Two. Rome One is for uh, they're called Rome 1, it's a regulation which was adopted for, it's, it's an international private law regulation, tells you which rules apply in which case uh, for uh, contractual obligations, and Rome 2 is for non-contractual obligations, like for example, pre-contractual obligations, so on and so forth. So, you have those problems, but you can't go around certain uh, linchpin tenets of uh, consumer protection policy. Uh, other curiosities, comments, interventions. Okay, if you're satisfied with it, then uh, I thank you for your attention. Then I hope I'll see you next time uh, if our cooperation agreement goes forward. Okay? <laughs>